Welcome to our continuing 2020 educational webinar series. I am Katherine Short, Partnership Marketing Manager for FIRST Healthcare Compliance. At FIRST Healthcare Compliance, we help you with a comprehensive compliance management solution tailored to your business. A hospital, hospital network, healthcare practice of any size, billing company, or skilled nursing facility, and we help you manage every aspect of a compliance program and our training library provides hundreds of modules that are easy to assign and track. As part of our complimentary educational webinar series, we bring you experts from around the country to discuss relevant topics in the healthcare industry. We are so pleased to have Cindy Grew, CHBME CEO and President of Healthcare Practice Management with us today. As founder and president of Healthcare Practice Management, Ms. Grew began her career as a healthcare computer systems consultant after receiving a degree in data processing, then joined a large ophthalmology practice where she served as the practice's business manager for six years. Cindy then successfully founded Healthcare Practice Management in 1992. Since that time, the company has grown to 55 practices with 80 providers operating in four different states. The company has grown from three to 26 employees with expertise in revenue cycle management, credentialing, consulting, billing software, and practice operations management. In addition to providing billing services, HCPM contracts with private practices and groups in the tri-state area for practice management and consulting assignments. As part of HCPM's consulting practice, Cindy has served as the administrator for a group of 19 podiatrists from 94 to 99. She was responsible for payer contract negotiations, monthly disbursements of income to the group, utilization tracking and management reports to the board of directors. And she also serves as an expert for litigation cases in the tri-state area. Ms. Grew is active in various professional and community organizations. Cindy obtained her certification as the Certified Healthcare Billing and Management Executive through HBMA in April 1999 and is a graduate of the HBMA Compliance Implementation course. She has served six years on the board of directors for HBMA, and she also served on the board for Dawn Training Institute and Harris Billing School. She also chaired the publications committee for 14 years for HBMA and, is, and currently serves as the committee member for RCM advisor and is also a graduate of the Dale Carnegie Training Program. Before we begin, I would like to mention that at First Healthcare Compliance, we strive to serve as a trusted resource for compliance professionals, and every month we celebrate their hard work and dedication with our Compliance Super Ninja re recognition. For our latest Super Ninja, our team is turning the spotlight on Jean Fleischer, Practice Administrator for Scott <laughs> A. Fleischer, MD, and Associates. Jean's favorite part of working for Scott A. Fleischer, MD and Associates is that she is very proud to be a part of this busy adult and geriatric psych psychiatry practice. The practice has stayed open through the entire COVID-19 pandemic and has continued to take care of patients compassionately and with great skill. With the support of their dedicated office, office staff, their clinicians make a real difference in the quality of life for many people. When asked whether she would prefer to have a constant supply of the best coffee in the world at her office or a constant supply of the best snacks in the world at her office, she chose, she said, uh, the coffee for sure. And she's been looking all her life for the best coffee in the world. So congratulations, Jean. Our team is honored to have the privilege of working with you and your office. So um, the a download is available of um, several different handouts, including a copy a PDF of the slides is available on the side or the upper control panel. Feel free to submit questions into the question box during the presentation. We will address questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Your PACOM and your PMI CEU certificates will be emailed to you following the broadcast. 
Your PACOM certificate will come directly from PACOM and your PMI certificate will come from our email. There's no need to request either one, they'll come automatically. Additional CEU opportunities will be available to BC Advantage members following the live broadcast. See their website for details. A download of the handout again is available with a button on the bottom right hand side of your screen or the side or the upper panel depending on which device you're using. So Cindy, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for being here and um, speaking with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I would like to welcome everyone this afternoon to our presentation of 2021 CPT code and documentation changes where CMS and AMA come together, hopefully to benefit our providers. I am sorry that we can't have this in person. Um, I look forward to the opportunity when we can do that again. But until then, um, we'll proceed with the webinar. And at the end, again, we will entertain questions and feel free to reach out to me after this presentation if you should have any additional questions. So welcome, let's get started. So today we're gonna to go over our objectives. We're gonna review history of CPT codes and documentation requirements. We're gonna discuss the CPT code changes that were published for 2021. We're gonna review changes in documentation secondary to coding changes, and hopefully walk away with an understanding of the changes in risk related to the future coding frameworks. In 2021, our codes have um, simplified ENM coding. It actually is the very first major overhaul for office visits and outpatient E&M coding in the last 25 years. The inclusion of time prior to 2021 was to assist in the selecting of the most appropriate level of E&M services. And beginning in January, uh, January 1st of 2021, time alone may be used to select the appropriate code level for office or other outpatient E&M services. I do want to note that there are different categories of services that use time differently. We'll get into that in detail a little further along. Let's look at some history. In 2020, CPT coding guidelines. We were required to report on history, exam, and medical decision making. Part of the history, we had to do history of present illness, review of systems, past medical, family, and social history. For the exam of our patient, we had to document body area or organ systems and the fun bulleted points, as well as the medical decision making to diagnose or treat options, and also consider the amount of complexity of data to be reviewed. In 2020 and in prior years, time could be used when coordination or counseling dominated the visit. The majority of providers still were billing under the traditional history exam and medical decision making. The issues with our current coding system, number one, it's outdated, very burdensome on the providers and the office. It's too complex, very disconnected and ambiguous. As we look for the key changes in 2021, the very first one to note is 99201 was deleted by AMA and recognized by CMS. So 99201 for a new patient lowest level is no longer a valid code option. Shocking that it made it this long because I'm not sure of any provider I've ever met that has ever billed a 99201 for a new patient visit. <clears throat> the creation of new codes, um, for extended visits, the 99417, which we'll get into detail, and a new complexity of service code, GPC1X from CMS, which will be in our HICS textbook. We'll talk a little more in detail along that line as well. The elimination of history and or physical exam in determining billable code level. I wanna emphasize in determining billable code level. We're not eliminating history and physical exam as part of the full picture, but we are, it is now eliminated when you are determining the billable code level. And additionally, our new foundation will be coding based on time or medical decision making. 
what was the motivation for this change? Um, prior to actually, I think back in, in 2018 and 2019, there were several rumors that um, they were going to change the coding system and basically lump all of our CPT codes together from 99212 through 215 and new patients 99202 to 205 and reimburse everybody the same. Needless to say, that did not go over well at all. So um, the motivation for change per CPT assistant basically says that documentation for an E&M office visit will now be centered around how physicians think and take care of their patients and not on mandatory standards that encourage copy, paste, and checking boxes, as I'm sure all of you can well appreciate that. CMS's take on it is to streamline the documentation requirements by eliminating history and physical exam elements for code selection, to provide physicians greater choice in determining code levels for office visits by simplifying the selection between medical decision making or total time, and to ensure payer consistency by modifying the criteria for medical decision making by adding and clarifying key definitions. The new codes for physicians and other qualified healthcare professionals, uh, the 99417, is a prolonged office or other outpatient E&M service beyond the minimum required time of using the primary procedure for which has been selected using total time. So keep in mind, we're working on total time here. Requiring total time with or without direct patient contact beyond the usual service on the date of the primary service. It's in 15-minute uh, increments, and it is listed separately in addition to coding of 99205 and 99215. So keep in mind, you will only use 99417 with either one of those new or established highest level visits. Since it is based on total time, any CPT code prior to the 215 and 205 are less minutes. So you've already hit the maximum of those two levels before you would then include the 99417. This is an interesting code, GPC1X. It's, um, it's trying to explain it, and, and I do believe that um, CMS is still going to come out with further clarification on this, on how this will be used. But the definition basically is a visit complexity inherent to E&M associated with medical care services that serve as a continuing focal point for all needed healthcare services and or with medical care services that are part of ongoing care related to the patient's single, serious, or complex chronic condition. Many providers feel that they are following patients with all of these underlying conditions which makes their visit that much more um, classified to receive additional income. So keeping in mind, that's what these codes are to be used for. It is an add-on code, so you would list it separately in addition to an office um, or outpatient E&M for a new or established patient. Now, I wanted to point out that the red X is a fifth digit of the new code, which will be provided in the 2021 HCPCS code set. Um, they have not yet classified what that code will be, so I just wanted you to be aware that that X will be placed with a digit. Now let's talk about new prolonged clinical staff services with physician or other qualified healthcare health provider supervision. Um, again, 99415 and 416 are new. It would be used for the, after the first hour of prolonged clinical staff service. It's reported only once on a given date, even if the time spent by the staff is not continuous, and that's important to remember. Prolonged service of less than 30 minutes is not reported. Whereas 99416, um, this code is used to report each additional 30 minutes of prolonged clinical staff services beyond the first hour. Prolonged services of less than 15 minutes beyond the first hour or less than 15 minutes beyond the final 30 minutes is not reported separately. So you do have to meet the maximum qualifications in order to use that code. Um, 
And I wanted to share some uh, a, a screenshot with you that in a table format that will help you as a reference um, if you are looking at billing services for your clinical staff. So the total duration of prolonged services table illustrates the correct reporting of prolonged services provided by the clinical staff with physician supervision in the office setting and beyond the initial 45 minutes of clinical staff time. So for example, if it's less than 45 minutes, it is not reported separately. If you, if the CPT code is 45 minutes to 74 minutes, that would be an hour and 14 minutes, you would build the 99415 times one and so forth. So I wanted to include this slide as a reference for you if you have a practice that you can be utilizing your clinical staff for additional billable services. I wanted to share an example of what that would look like. So 99415 is the highest total time in the time ranges of codes. Again, I have another slide to share with you on all of the minutes of that. Um, the description is used in defining when prolonged time services begin. So prolonged clinical staff services, for example, on a 99214 begin after 39 minutes, and 99415 is not reported until at least 69 minutes total face-to-face -face clinical staff time has been performed. When face-to-face -face time is non-continuous, you will only use face-to-face -face time provided to the patient by the clinical staff. Another example I can share is um, one that comes to mind is in a pediatrician's office, a child comes in and now has to be on a nebulizer treatment. Um, so the provider is going to work not only with the caretakers, the mom, dad, grandmother, grandfather, um, and the child. They're going to teach them how to perform the nebulizer treatments, and they're going to monitor that child in the waiting room or in another room while the provider can run off and, and treat another patient. At that point in time, when the provider does not have to be fully in, engaged in that one particular patient, is where your clinical staff can take over and you'll want to start monitoring the time at that point. So I hope that was helpful. Note that 99416, each additional 30 minutes is listed separately. Shared and split visits. Actually, this still can be done, but you need to make sure you document it properly. If a nurse practitioner begins with the patient and then transfers to the physician on the same date of service, you can actually add up the time for the nurse practitioner and the time with the physician if you're going to choose reporting on time basis. If the nurse practitioner and physician meet with this patient at the same time, you cannot count that as twice. So it has to be two separate services provided on the same day by two different individuals. Um, if they're working together in the same room at the same time, you would usually just bill uh, for the physician's time and not the nurse practitioner. AMA's definition of time. The AMA states that the definition of time is the minimum time, not the typical time, and represents total physician or qualified healthcare professional time on the date of service. The use of these codes requires face-to-face -face encounter by the physician or QHP and includes the total face-to-face -face and non-face-to-face -face time. Again, that's very important. We'll go into more detail. The total time does not include time for activities normally performed by clinical staff. Just typical activities for time billing for providers or qualified healthcare professionals include preparing to see the patient, review of tests, counseling and education with the patient, family, caregiver, documenting clinical information in the electronic health record, obtaining and or reviewing separately obtained history, whereas in that example, whereas a patient um, may fill out a form to provide you with the history where you no longer are required to check all those boxes off in your electronic health record to prove that you have gone through all of the history and what have you. Um, ordering medications, tests, or procedures. Referring and communicating with other healthcare professionals when you are not reporting that separately. 
independently interpreting, interpreting results, again, not reported separately, and communicating those results to the patient, family, or caregiver. Performing a medically appropriate exam and or evaluation, and care coordination, again, not reported separately. For those who were in the Seinfeld years, I thought this was just hysterical because um, the famous last words are, have been, and always will be. No supporting documentation, no claim payment for you. Next, that's our soup Nazi in the picture. And you know, the sad part of this is the reality is even if you don't have your documentation, um, your supporting documentation appropriate and you bill for service, you will get paid for it. It's when an audit gets triggered or a random audit is performed and your documentation does not meet the requirements is where you find yourself in trouble with insurance companies. So again, I'm going to harp on paint the picture, tell us a story. Remember those words as we continue to go through this, the next few slides. Documentation may really not be reduced. Providers will be impacted by the need to document to support both billing and auditing. However, the AMA and CMS haven't yet issued guidelines or requirements for what could be audited in the future to ensure proper ENM coding according to the new requirements. So again, more to come. At a bare minimum, my recommendation is it's important to note how the code was selected. Tell us whether you're choosing to build this based on and document based on medical decision making or the time used. It's worth noting that it's been stated that these changes are intended to help to decrease auditing documentation requirements. But to be safe, providers should still document the work done to prove the time spent when coding according to time as well as ensure clear documentation in the note, which outlines the specifics set forth in the medical decision-making definitions when coding for medical decision-making. Um, I didn't want to forget to share with you, we're going to um, approach three slides of which you will have a handout for, and all of that same information is on one page, which will show you the changes for the medical decision-making. So if you're choosing to the provider is choosing to bill based on medical decision making, um, it will be very helpful to refer to that handout. <clears throat> it's important to prove medical necessity for anything claimed and each individual payer will likely have different requirements for this, so it's necessary for providers to keep this in mind. Use of time in other settings. Time is not a descriptive component for emergency department levels of service. So any emergency department billing will be billing as usual, um, as you did in 2020. <clears throat> I wanted to show you a comparison. This is also a very helpful chart from the AMA. So this will show you office or other outpatient services compared to other E&M codes. So for example, down the left side, components for code selection, history and exam. For 2021, office or other outpatient services as medically appropriate. So your history and exam is not used in your code selection. Whereas um, hospital observation, hospital inpatient, consultations, emergency room, nursing facilities, domiciliary, rest home, and custodial care as well as home visits, you must use your key components, history, exam, medical decision making. So anything outside of your office or outpatient services, you will continue to use um, your documentation to support how you have in the past. Again, on the left-hand side, your medical decision making and your time components, um, you may use either one on the date of the encounter. And again, under your other locations of service, you would use your key components. All right, so I wanted to share with you um, each level of service for your e and codes. As discussed, 99201 is a deleted code. So there is obviously no time element there. And we look at 99202 through 205, and it looks very consistent to what we are used to in 2020. So you have, it requires your medical appropriate history and or exam. 
and straightforward medical decision making. And I've included these to um, share with you the time allotments for each visit. So as you can see, the 99205 goes up to 74 minutes. So when you're billing in time and you it becomes prolonged services with the new code, the 99417, you will have to have hit your 74 minute level in order to then start using the add-on code. And same with your established visits. Now keeping in mind 99211, um, does not usually require the presence of a physician or other qualified healthcare professional. Therefore, time is not a part of the um, 2021 documentation purposes. So for your established visits up through your 99215, it's talking, um, sharing that you can have 45 minutes. If you go over your 45 minutes, that's where your add-on additional prolonged service codes come in. But if you're using medical decision making, the codes are very consistent and still um, the definitions are the same as what they were in 2020. So the new medical decision making guidelines really comes down to three choices. We're gonna establish a diagnosis, we're gonna assess the status of a condition, and we're gonna select management options. There's three elements of medical decision making. Number one, the number and complexity of the problems addressed during the encounter. Number two, the amount and or complexity of the data to be reviewed and analyzed. And number three, what are the risks of complications, morbidity, and or mortality of the patient, management decisions made at the visit associated with the patient's problems, diagnostic procedures, and treatment. Medical decision making is based on two out of three of these elements. So very similar to 2020 and previous years, when you are using medical decision making, you need to hit two out of these three elements. Now I'm gonna go into details. And like I said, the spreadsheet that we will offer for you um, as a, a handout, will give you all of these details. So don't feel like the need to have to be writing all this stuff down. I wanted to just go over it with you um, and then provide you with the handout for your reference. Element number one, the number and complexity of problems addressed. Problem, minimal, limited, multiple, or extensive. Disease, condition, illness, injury, symptoms, sign, findings, complaints, I'm not going to read all of those to you, but this will be used as a reference for you in the future. And how many problems are you addressing? Evaluated or treated at the encounter by the physician or QHP. Uh, consideration of further testing or treatment that may not be elected by virtue of risk or benefit analysis or patient, parent, guardian, or surrogate choice. All of this takes time to make sure that you are addressing. This is how a physician thinks. Um, when you're documenting for medical decision making, you still wanna make sure you are notating um, all of this information. Another professional is managing the problem without additional assessment or care coordination documented does not qualify as being addressed or managed by the physician. So just because you notate, you know, following with a cardiologist, all good, that doesn't count for you. You are treating the patient today. You are documenting for the reason that the patient is there. That's what will help you address your level of service to be billing for. Element two is the amount of data to be reviewed. This refers to the amount and complexity of the data to be reviewed, information gathered from sources other than the history and physical, lab tests, imaging, other diagnostic services, old records, history from sources other than the patient. Basically, the guidelines ask you that you record the decision to seek additional information, and if you've obtained that information, you document the results of your review of it. Very, very important to be able to track back. Okay, the provider requested this, that, and that, and they've reviewed it, and now they're commenting as to what their take on that was. And element three in selecting risk management options. Again, uh, comorbidities, underlying diseases, or other factors that increase risk should be documented. All surgical procedures and invasive diagnostic procedures performed 
or planned should be documented as specifically as possible. If you perform a procedure during an EMM, document the specific procedure. And if you request, plan, or refer for a such procedure, document the type of procedure. For example, I'm referring this patient for a laparoscopy because blah, 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 blah. If you refer or decide to perform such a procedure urgently, urgently being a key word there, stress that urgency in your documentation. It should be clearly communicated by that record. When an auditor comes in and looks at your record, you want to be able to hand this to them and they should be able to look at this and see the painted picture. You are painting a picture of your decisions and what you, your future decisions are and why based on this patient's visit today. So paint the picture. Okay, medical decision making. There's four levels of medical decision making, as you saw in the descriptions of the CPT code. So they're straightforward, low, moderate, or high. And those descriptions are coordinated with those levels of um, EM services. Again, medical decision making does not apply to 99211. This is um, another helpful chart. Keeping in mind that medical decision making is determined by the chart below. Two of three elements for a level must be met or exceeded in your documentation to choose the appropriate level of coding. So this is where an auditor comes in and will go through your level of medical decision making, straightforward, low, moderate, high, the number of complexity of problems discussed. Are there a minimal documented, low, moderate, or high? Amount or complexity of data to be reviewed? Again, minimal, limited, moderate, or extensive, and the risks of complications or morbidity, minimal, low, moderate, high. So as they go through the documentation, they're going to determine how many complexity problems that were, were addressed in your documentation. And they're gonna circle, it might have been low. And then how much data did they review or analyze? Well, if it was limited, now you're looking at um, 99213, and then um, your, your risk or complications. So two of the three, which however they fall. So if it was a moderate number of complexity of problems, but a limited amount of data reviewed and moderate risk for com uh, or complications, then it would be a 214 or a 204 because you've hit the two buckets, the two highest, um, and you can pick those two that will determine that level very similar to what we have done in the past. So if medical decision-making is your deciding factor for the first level, the existing guidelines that have been in place since 1995 must still be followed. So business as usual. Now this is the chart that um, is your handout. So the next three slides basically all fit on one page, but based on a presentation, the best I could do is three slides. So this will give you some um, more detail as far as determining, for example, one, so the number of, um, and complexity of problems. So a 99202 or 212 is considered minimal because it's one self-limited or minor problem with minimal, minimal risk of morbidity from additional diagnostic testing or treatment. And basically minimal or no data to be reviewed. 99203 and 213. So you look at the complexity of the problems. It's low, there's two or more minor, limited or minor problems, or one stable chronic illness, or one acute, uncomplicated illness or injury. So the patient could be stable and have chronic illnesses, so you've started with that um, hitting that bucket. Now this is where the changes really come into play for you. The amount or complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. So every time you'll see the little red asterisk, each unique test, order, or document contributes to a combination of two or a combination of three in category one below. So 
this will help drive the detail and or time that you are spending working with this patient. So in category one, you have any combination of two from the following. Your review of prior external notes from each unique source. Your review of results for, of each unique test or ordering of each unique test. Again, every unique test that you are ordering, reviewing, or looking from prior external notes must be documented. Or you can go to category two, um, assessment requiring independent historians. For categories of independent or interpretation of tests and discussion of management or test interpretation, see moderate or high. So it will help you move through the um, levels to determine which CPT code is appropriate. 204, obviously your complexity of problems become more, more options for you to choose from. I have one or more chronic illness with exas uh, exasperation, progression, or side effects of treatment or I have two or more stable chronic illnesses, or I have one undiagnosed new problem with uncertain prognosis, or one acute illness with symptomatic symptoms, or one acute complicated injury. So again, you'll wanna come back to review until you get comfortable with your documentation based on the levels of codes. Again, it gets into, um, more complexity of data, and you have three categories that you would um, potentially, so you have, you must meet requirements of at least one out of the three categories to be at a level 99204 or 214. Again, with uh, 205 and 215, the amount of complexity of data, you must meet the requirements of at least two out of the three categories. You're looking at your problems, um, one or more chronic illnesses, one acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. Risk and complications, um, they actually did include some examples which will be helpful. And I also did include um, in your handouts a frequently asked question. I'm sure there will be more of those coming um, as we get closer to 2021 and into January of 2021 when people start utilizing this uh, new process for the medical decision making um, and or now billing strictly on time. Also keep in mind, there's only 24 hours in a day. So if you are billing everybody on time, you wanna make sure that you're billing appropriate to the amount of time that you are actually working. Um, I have seen situations in the past when I get involved in the, um, legal expert matters where practices are billing for prolonged services, say in a hospital, and they still do exist, those codes still exist for the hospital coding, but they also treated patients for six hours that day. And when you put all of those billable hours together for the levels that they have billed, they're way over 24 hours in a given day. So be careful. When you're billing time, make sure you're documented appropriately and capturing that information appropriately. Okay, so billing prolonged service for 99417. Again, this is a chart you want, want to reference. Um, this is only used for 99205 or 215. And it now shows you your time requirements and when and how many units to bill of the 99417 based on additional time. So it's a good reference, quick guide for you. For compliance, um, the biggest issue is accurate calculation of time. And how are you gonna make that happen in your practice? You wanna support the time that is spent, um, leveling for medical decision-making criteria, and differing criteria for inpatient visits and consultations. Keeping in mind, this is only for your office visits and outpatient services. Any inpatient, business as usual, back to the 1995-1997 guidelines that have been in place for a long time now. 
So structure your documentation to support your medical decision making or time-based coding for reimbursement. I wanted to share some resources with you. Um, on the right-hand side under CMS, the fact sheet, that is the actual link to the fact sheet that I have provided as a handout. If you would like to read the final rule presentation, there's the link to that. Um, the AMA has a tremendous amount of educational information. Um, very good resource. A lot of this information that I'm providing today came from the AMA. So I put the link for their educational website um, as well as email updates. So you can go to that link and sign up to receive emails um, of updated information from the AMA. And they also have interactive learning uh, modules and have created those as well for the um, new guidelines for the 2021 documentation requirements. So a very good resource to um, follow and to share with your providers because this is new to them when they're looking at time billing and you just wanna make sure you're covering all of your bases to support what you are billing so you are able to maintain that money um, in an audit. So I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, I thank you all for being here, and I look forward to the opportunity to um, cross paths again in the future. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you so much, Cindy. We do have a few questions. So the Wonderful. first one, yeah, great. Um, let me see your, uh, let's see. It looks like your, uh, your, your, um, Perhaps your, um, I think your mouse might, there you go. I was going to say your mouse okay, was on perfect. top of your, your name there. <laughs> perfect. Okay. Uh, the first question is, um, how do we keep track of time? What's the best way to do that that you recommend? Oh, my goodness. That's a really good question. Um, let's keep in mind in 2020 and previous years, you did have the option to build time. So, Obviously, you had a way to do that, a mechanism to keep track of that. Now, having said that, um, time will become a more important part of your world in 2021, especially when you're able to bill for prolonged services for the provider and the new coding for clinical staff. So my recommendation would be, as a practice, you're going to want to come up with a system that works for you and all of you. That includes sitting down with your staff and kind of walking through the process. How are we going to be able to track this? Do we need to have a clock in every room? I mean, obviously you don't want to have a patient see you start a timer and then do their visit and stop the timer and, and put that down. Um, I can't imagine that they would require you to put start and stop time, but if you are billing for time and you are now adding on your additional prolonged services, you already know based on the timelines for that code um, for 99215 it's 45 minutes and you're an hour and 15 into it so now you're going to add the 99417 you want to be able to say i have billed i am billing based on time as i have spent more than 74 minutes um, in this visit doing blah 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 and and document what it is that you're doing you're coordinating care with other providers, with other family members. Again, paint the picture. Keep in mind to um, make sure you're, that your clinical staff is aware of the process and how they are going to keep track of their time, especially if you're billing for prolonged services for their um, additional income. Okay, all right, great. All right, so we have another question here. Um, let me see. Are you basically advising that billing for all other service locations other than the office or outpatient services is business as usual? Very good question. I would say that is a true statement, yes. Um, keeping in mind, when you, if you're not billing on time and you are billing on medical decision making, to review the handout because the categories that you are reviewing that gives you the guideline of what you need to document and if you follow those guidelines if you're if you believe that this is um, a 99214 then you want to make sure 
your documentation supports those categories, um, it actually should help you in your documentation process versus the old bullets, points, click, make sure I get 10 of this body part um, in order not to be dinged. You know, so they, they took that all out of it. Now it's looking at it from the perspective, it's business as usual, same in the hospital, inpatient, consults, everything, nothing's changing except your medical decision-making documentation could be categorized better. So I hope that's helpful. Okay. All right. Um, if I'm using MDM as my preference for billing a particular service today, I don't have to document the history and the physical. Is that correct? Hmm. Okay. Yes and no. I would say that um, you do need to document some history and physical because you're obviously still treating the patient. And as a provider, you still need to know that background information. Now, how you get that is a different picture in 2021. For example, you could hand a patient a um, form at the front desk and ask them to complete that. And when they walk in the room as a provider, um, you review that and note that you have reviewed it and scanned it into the patient's chart, electronic health record, or into their paper chart. But you do not have to go through and click off all these bullet points that you've done this, 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 this for every body organ part. So yes, you're still doing the history and exam. You're just not, it's not counting against you um, in your documentation purposes for selection of the code. So I hope that helps. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, looks like we have another question here. Um, how will I make adjustments in my EHR to accommodate these changes? That's a good question. That is a really good question. And I think that's probably a very strong focus of where practices need to look, especially um, for the fact that your previous templates were probably set up to address all of your point click copy paste previous visits and what have you mm -hmm. well now that's going to change so you're going to have to work very closely with your um, vendor your electronic health vendor and explain to them what's happening and how can your templates be adjusted um, in working with the new medical decision requirements. I mean, that might be a good place to start with your vendor. Say, here's the requirements that we now have to meet. How can you set this up for me to be able to do that? And the sooner you get on that, the better. Um, obviously, this is starting January 1st, and it's now December. So very important that you work very closely with them and maybe need um, a committee in your office to help do that. Okay. And I wish you all well with that. Sounds a bit daunting. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have any other words of advice for us? I think any other questions, we're going to have to take those um, offline and um, perhaps through email. But um, but do you have any other um, words of advice for us or things that you can recommend, things um, such as that? I would say, um, as I stated previously, I think the AMA has a tremendous amount of information. They've been actively involved in this whole process from the beginning. Um, I think that that's a good resource for you. Um, I think the biggest important factor would be coming up with a logical solution for keeping track of your time and making sure it's documented. And then I believe that probably, and I've actually had providers reach out to me to do chart audits in 2021, starting in March, April timeframe to see if their documentation is now meeting the new requirements. So on a prospective basis, I, I would recommend that you consider doing that, whether you internally audit or look for an outside auditor to come in and give you guidance prior to an insurance company coming back and saying you're doing it wrong. Um, additionally, I've seen from a perspective of practices that have done that, if they find themselves in trouble with an insurance company, usually that plays a lot of weight to say, look, we have addressed this. 
um, you know, you've gone and did have taken a look back two years prior. Well, and at the end of last year, we did have a chart audit and it was brought to our attention and these are the changes that we made. So anything that you can utilize to support your position uh, will help you in any of those situations from my experience. And okay. I would say do not hesitate to reach out. I mean, we're all going to go through these changes. We survived ICD-10, and we will survive this. Um, but just be diligent in your practices to make sure that you feel comfortable that your documentation is supporting the services you are providing, and it should make your life easier without having to be fearful of um, every exam, physical exam, and um, information from the bullet standpoint of the history that you don't have to worry like, hey, I didn't document it this time. I know the history. I'm following this patient. I'm good. Document the important things of what you're doing for that visit today. Your Every single visit should be able to stand on their own. So when an auditor comes in and requests charts, they're going to pick a certain date of service. They need to look at that date of service and know everything that transpired that supported the level that you're billing for today. Not yesterday, not last week. So keeping that in mind will protect you moving forward. That's a lot of really great advice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh you're very welcome. Okay. Um, well, I wanted to, yes, thank you again so much for being here, Cindy, and um, to encourage our listeners to uh, to reach out and um, and contact you with any questions at all. And, uh, well, thank we have you our... for the opportunity to present to you. Sure, sure. Well, um, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we have had a lot of uh, questions on this, and so uh, I want to encourage our, our attendees to reach out. And um, remember, attendees, you can also, uh, later on, if you, if you wanted to review this again, um, you can watch, you can review it again on our, our YouTube channel. We have, um, uh, we have a lot of, of our um, webinars on there, and you'll be able to review this again if you have questions. Of course, we have our downloads um, of the, uh, you know, of the slides here, um, and then of other handouts that uh, Cindy has uh, generously provided. Um, so I think there's three handouts um, that will be available here. So uh, make sure that you get those as well. Um, they're wonderful resources. Um, so please use the contact information on the screen for any other any additional questions. Um, if you think of any others later, you can send those the questions to us and we'll forward them on. Uh, please remember your PACOM and PMI CEU certificate will be emailed to you from within two days following the broadcast, if not sooner. There's no need to request it. You can register for future webinars or request a demo of our compliance solution on our website at firsthcc.com or call us at 888-543-4778. And thank you for joining us.